The Los Angeles Police Academy evolved from a private pistol range, providing off-duty recreational activities for policemen to the present full-time training facility. A 22-acre Elysian Park site was leased from the Department of Recreation and Parks. Off-duty policemen, assisted by Lincoln Heights jail trustees, began the original construction in 1925. A 25 and 50-yard line and a small cook shack were in full operation by 1930. The 10th Olympiad Committee selected the police range as the site for the 1932 Olympic pistol events. At the close of the games, the department obtained a large mess hall, which had been built to accommodate the visiting Olympic team athletes. The hall was dismantled and moved from its original site near Vernon and Crenshaw Boulevards to the Revolver Club land. It was reassembled to form the framework of the clubhouse. A $3,000 profit from the sale of reload ammunition was used to convert the building into a suitable clubhouse. The old mess hall is now unrecognizable behind its arched facade of masonry in the style of the California missions. The paved patio flowing around a graceful fountain enhances the main entrance to the academy. The Los Angeles Police Revolver and Athletic Club was incorporated in 1934 in an attempt to provide a police training center. Private funds were raised by a group of businessmen, and members of the department contributed $10 and 4% of one month's pay. In 1935, a festival in the Shrine Auditorium and a Coliseum pageant raised additional funds. West of the clubhouse, 80,000 cubic yards of sandstone were excavated from the canyon wall to level the academy's athletic field. The eastern canyon wall was transformed into an ornamental rock garden featuring a triple waterfall descending to a large rock patio suitable for barbecues and picnics. The work is simulated sandstone strata artistically designed to produce changing color effects similar to the Grand Canyon in Arizona. The structural design of the clubhouse rendered impossible the orthodox construction technique of adding an upper floor. The addition of a second story was accomplished by excavating and constructing below the main building. Additions to the original structure were skillfully completed. The present building tapers south from the original one-story clubhouse to three stories at the southern end. This is Thomas Redden, Chief of Police of Los Angeles, California. Nearly three million people live within its 463 square miles. In 1966, they made almost two million telephone calls for assistance to the Los Angeles Police Department. To respond to these calls for help, the city employs 5,192 police officers. Of these, 2,214 are assigned to uniform duty. 1,179 are actually deployed during an average 24-hour period. This amounts to 393 officers for each eight-hour watch, less than one officer per square mile. We have 1.87 policemen for every 1,000 people, the lowest ratio of any of the five largest cities in the nation. In 1935, our radio communication system was the most advanced in the world. Today, more than 30 years later, this system is essentially unchanged. For the needs of proper command and control, the system is overloaded and inadequate. At present, there are times when no police units are available to respond to calls. They already are on assigned calls and cannot be reached even in cases of extreme emergency. On March 2, 1967, there were no units available 14% of the 24 hours. During the eight hour night watch of the same day, no units were available 22% of the time. Of course, a partial answer is more policemen. 
However, we cannot wait. And more policemen alone is not a panacea for all of our law enforcement problems. It is essential that we update our equipment and procedures to take advantage of the increased efficiency available from modern technology. A study of our communications by the Institute for Defense Analyses reveals some interesting data. For emergency calls, the average overall response time was 6.3 minutes for cases involving crimes not cleared by arrest. Emergency call response was 4.1 minutes for cases in which arrests were made. Response time is extremely significant in increasing the effectiveness of our patrol forces in making arrests at the scene. There is an even greater benefit inherent in this. That is, the lives and property that would be saved if we can cut our response time significantly. The resources of the department are activated when a call for help is received from someone in the community. The calls are channeled to the Police Department Communication Division, where the calls are fed through a rotary system to one of 15 positions on the complaint board. The information received is converted to a message form on which most of the common crimes and incidents are pre-printed to save time. As the officer talks with the caller, he is writing down the information. At the conclusion of the call, the message form is transferred via conveyor belt to the radio room. The conveyor belt drops the message at the dispatcher's position in the center of a horseshoe arrangement of radio positions. One of the two dispatchers picks up the message and checks the street index guide. This guide is a reference which gives the geographic patrol division and district by address of the call. After determining the division and district, the dispatcher moves to the radio position which controls the cars in that area. The dispatcher, having ascertained the correct car and district, moves to the status board where the knobs indicate car assignment and current status. If the car assigned to the district is not available, the dispatcher must select the closest clear unit. He assigns that unit designation to the message form and gives it to the radio telephone operator broadcasting calls for that geographic division. There are three main outgoing radio frequencies to handle 16 patrol divisions, accident investigation, and motorcycle units. Last year, our communications handled 4,185,000 radio messages. So it becomes immediately apparent that airtime is at a premium. The operator, by a series of lights at her position, determines when her frequency is available to transmit calls and dispatches the message to the concerned unit. The radio unit acknowledges and proceeds to the scene of the call. At this time, the other side of the problem becomes visible. The communications problem of mobile units attempting to get access to the resources of the department necessary for them to conduct their field investigations. The most common need is for immediate information regarding suspects' identification, warrants, wanted vehicles, and stolen property. The officer's only access is through radio, and there may be from 12 to 80 other mobile units using the same frequency. Again, we have a problem of a fight for airtime. When the officer does receive clearance to broadcast, he transmits his request. This comes into one of the radio telephone operators in the communications complex. On suspects, the radio telephone operator gets the name and description and clothing worn. This information is given to the dispatcher, who walks it across to another part of the horseshoe, where it is sent via pneumatic tube to Records and Identifications Division. There, one file is checked for possible warrants, and the criminal record index is searched. If it is indicated that a criminal record exists, the criminal package is then searched 
and the arrest record information is entered on the form. The information is returned via pneumatic tube to the radio room to the dispatcher, then to the radio telephone operator who broadcasts the information out to the requesting unit. When the officer requests information about a possible stolen vehicle, the radio telephone operator copies the license number on a message form. It is picked up by the dispatcher and taken to the end of the horseshoe where a Model 35 teletypewriter is connected to the California Highway Patrol computer in Sacramento. In a matter of seconds, Western States stolen information is returned. If a wider area of search is indicated, the inquiry can be routed through the Highway Patrol Auto Status System to the National Crime Information Center computer maintained by the FBI in Washington, D.C. This same information system will shortly be available in a limited sense for stolen property. At present, a request for stolen property information must be directed from the radio room to records and identification where a telephonic inquiry is made by direct line to CII in Sacramento. Our system has been evaluated by a number of agencies who tell us that for a comparatively speaking manual system, it is quite efficient, but it takes time, a great deal of time, time we cannot afford and time that the victims of crime cannot afford. The proposition is simple. If we can get there faster, we can apprehend more criminals. In Los Angeles, we propose the instant cop. By this, we mean a technological fusion of men, communications, computers, and vehicular equipment. We would have a capacity for instantaneous dispatching, coupled with a near instantaneous arrival of officers at a crime location, with sufficient electronic and other exotic equipment in the police car to provide the means to swiftly transact the investigation. The present state-of-the-art in technology could provide many sophisticated electronic aids. The first requirement is a computer system. Computers will, of course, serve a great many clerical functions we are now laboriously doing by hand. But there are some more unusual functions they can additionally perform. A computerized car locator is needed. By this, we visualize a system by which a scanning dish or similar device would pick up signals and report the location of each police unit at 30 second intervals. The signals would be relayed to a communications command center where they would be converted to a visual display map. This would give us constant control of total field deployment and knowledge of which units are closest to the crime locations. When the closest available unit is determined, the automated dispatching of police units to the crime scene could be accomplished by a push-button console, again saving valuable time. Field units require more immediate information. It is essential that we automate want, warrant, and criminal record information. This need has become even more imperative because of the tenuous legal position in questioning persons on the street. This information could be requested from the police unit by a digital overlay or keyboard input device. The return information could be relayed through a cathode ray tube or a printout arrangement in the police vehicle. This would not only save time, but would relieve the strain on our overloaded radio system. In another area, we need a means of two-way communications with officers on a beat or away from their vehicles. A miniaturized transceiver radio with a swing-down microphone could be mounted in the helmet. We also need a mobile panic button or homing device which will transmit a signal for help in case the personalized radio malfunctions or officers do not have time to use it. 
A miniature radio might also be disguised as a flashlight, or it could be mounted as an additional item on the Sam Brown belt. Such devices would increase the flexibility and efficiency of beat officers. They could prevent many serious injuries and possibly save policemen's lives by enabling them to get immediate help in emergency situations. All these aids are within the present capability of industry. Today's police car, with radio equipment and a shotgun, represents a capital investment of $2,700. The future vehicle of the instant cop would be, compared to the alternatives, very cheap indeed at $10,000 per car. For the past 15 years, we have hired every single individual who has qualified, and we have only netted 600 men. It therefore becomes of only academic interest to speak in terms of doubling our present force. However, with the multiple potential of improved mobility, faster communication, and new electronic devices, the instant cop may be available to perform the work that requires more than one officer now. If our existing 500 patrol vehicles were converted to $10,000 electronic police cars, the $5 million price tag would be less than 5% of the cost of adding 5,000 men to our force. Less than 7% of the budget is now spent on equipment to enhance the policeman's effectiveness. Even if we could hire an additional 5,000 men, good business practice would dictate giving each man the best tools to work with. In the longer view, our new concept becomes not only economically feasible, but essential. Crime on the streets is continuing its upward spiral, and we have serious social problems. We also know that unfortunately the things we need are going to cost a great deal of money. However, these are the essential needs of the department, and they are available from the technology of industry. By building our capability in the 4C area of command, control, computers, and communications, I believe that law enforcement will become truly effective against crime in our streets. <laughs>